So I'm going to take you on a journey of what I've learned about hyperborea and um, say at the start, I, I, I don't know why, I, I'm attuned to this land, I love this landscape. Um, and then I started having visions about it and it was very clear to me that um, I'd heard the story of hyperborea and it's very clear to me that this land was hyperborea. Also clear to me that it had once been part of Atlantis. This is in my early 20s. Um, I probably thought I was cuckoo, you know, <laughs> all this losery stuff, typical naive young man um, stuff. But um, there it was, it wouldn't go away. And um, so I, like, like I talked about yesterday, I came from a point of view of having had a vision and then some sort of inner knowledge given to me about it. Uh, connected with the work I had to do. Although at that time I thought I was going to be an architect forevermore, um, designing buildings. So I um, didn't know the full plan for my life. We often we don't, do we? <laughs> it, it kind of uh, changes come like thunderbolts sometimes. Anyway, um, I came across. Um, well, I studied the Greek myths very, very thoroughly when I was at university, also all the um, different myths um, of the world, and, and have carried on studying them, because they, they carry the wisdom in them. And it's good to compare one thing with another, um, from culture to culture, to get a better idea. And then to realize that they're all linked with the landscape. All the great myths are linked with the landscape. So they tell you something about the landscape and how the wisdom is manifesting through the land and the people who live in that land in that landscape. We get affected by the land and the wisdom in it. And it comes into our consciousness somehow or other and affects the way we behave, the way we f feel, our emotions, and, um, and other things like that. And even what we do in the landscape, even where we decide to build things and what we call them, you know, that uh, Chris has been um, giving an idea of. Um, so it's, it's kind of a wonderful journey. So I looked at the Greek myths, and one of the wonderful Greek myths, one of the very older Greek myths, it's also uh, part of the Orphic mysteries, uh, concerns Hyperborea. And it's named after the um, Greek name for the north wind, Boreas. And it's a wonderful story, if you go back to the oldest myths, wonderful story about that. That's, before the beginning, before even anything manifested, there was the, the great darkness. And the Greeks called this Nox, and saw Nox as a goddess, a fem feminine principle. Nox, night, it's a wonderful night that just was, well, just that's, that was it. There was nothing in it. Just well, what in the Bible, of course, is called the darkness or the deep. You know, it's difficult, you can't put definite names to, to something that's beyond comprehension. It's just an idea of, of this great darkness, this night. And then um, Knox woke up. She'd been asleep. She woke up and she wanted to move. She wanted to dance and express her love, her joy for, for life, coming into life uh, that was hidden within her. And she, she moved in a dance in a certain direction, from north towards the south. And as she moved, she created a wind. And this wind is the north wind, Boreas. So from where she started, as she moved southwards from the point she started at, you get the idea she started in the north point. The north was her source, the source of her movement. And then she moves southwards and she creates, in her movement, she creates this north wind, the Boreas. And this north wind takes on a consciousness and a beingness of its own, and it falls in love with Nox, the goddess, uh, and desires her. And they have a love of uh, the wind, you know, in the imagination of the Greeks, the wind wound itself round her like a serpent and impregnated her. And she became, um, she gave birth, um, well, she had a, she, she gave birth to an egg, a golden egg, um, it's called and hatched this egg, and out of this egg was born Farnes, the light, also known as Eros, 
which means love. Love and light go together um, in the old myths, the, the old comprehension of people. As soon as love is expressed like that, it is light, it shines. So Farnes means the shining one or the light, light of God. Um, and this is the creation myth, the oldest Greek creation myths, which themselves come from Thracia, from the Orphi Orphics, who themselves may have borrowed their myths from this, this land, because the um, more one researches, the more one finds there's a lot of what's in the Greek culture, including the story of the Trojan War, or, the, or some of the things behind the Trojan War story, all relate originally to this landscape of Britain and northern France. Um, and then, through migrations, they were carried down to the Aegean area and in later cultures became embodied as the myths and stories of, of the Greeks and other nations there. Um, but isn't this a lovely story? This, this darkness that moves in, in a, this joy, this wanting to express herself as this loving life. And she moves from north to south and creates this north wind that impregnates her. She becomes pregnant with this, this egg, and the egg hatches out and produces light. Out comes the light, which is love, the expression of her love as light. Um, of course, one, one um, thinks, well, this is all about the feminine principle and her child. Where's the male principle? <laughs> well, the male principles seem to get hidden in these stories, but the male principle is there, which obviously which comes into the north wind and impregnates her and gets her pregnant. In fact, the Egyptians saw these two principles together, the male principle, Artem, lying within the, the great ocean of darkness that the Egyptians saw it as, and again, they love, and they produce light as a result. And the light was described um, in two ways, a feminine way and a, and a masculine way. The feminine way was as Tefnut, the goddess Tefnut, symbolized as a bow, representing the heart. She was the heart goddess, the goddess of the heart of God, the all good. And the male principle was called Shu, S-H-U, Shu, symbolized as the arrow, representing the radiance of the light of the heart. So you've got the bow and arrow symbol right back there in ancient Egyptian symbolism. And before the ancient Egyptians was Atlantis and um, the British mysteries and, and the Hyperborean mysteries um, lying behind that. So when, when we come to look at the idea of Hyperborea as being the, also known to the Greeks as the land of Apollo, and we look back at what, what we've seen, to, uh, seen yesterday that through researches by Anne Macaulay and others, Apollo is a much older name, not, not from Greek, Greece originally, but belonging or can be related to this land in, in a certain key way. You get the idea of Apollo means something a little bit more and deeper than most of the Greeks understood it. I think the um, sages like Pythagoras and so on would have understood the much more profound meaning of Apollo. But um, Apollo, land of Apollo, is giving you the idea of that light, that first light, not the later light of the physical sun or something. It's the, it's the prime, primal light, the original light that what's called in tradition, not just the Christian tradition, but other traditions, as the firstborn. The Orphic tradition refers to Eros or Farnes as the firstborn, meaning the first expression of the divine, the first manifestation of the divine. It's pure light of love, which shines from the heart. And you know, even, even with physical science, physical scientists refer to the Big Bang having occurred and brought the universe into being, which they're still measuring the extent of the physical universe. Well, if you ask them where, where is the center, where do they think that center is, um, they actually speak the same language as the ancient philosophers. They say, well, that center's everywhere. It's not in a, any particular location. It's, it's everywhere. So you get, get that they're in, through physical science, they're actually giving out the same message as the ancient philosophers that said that the heart of God is like a center of a circle. 
a center that is everywhere within a circumference that is nowhere. And this center shines, shines with light. And its radiance is this shoe or hue. Sometimes the S is dropped. You get the hue. And from that, you get the link with um, what Anthony and, and um, all of us have been talking about. Hue is the same as Lu. The, the L and the H were synonymous with each other in the, in the Celtic language. So hue, the word hue is the same as Lu, um, which can be spelt in different ways. Um, so that that's gives you a connection between uh, with Apollo and with the divine light, the original light, the firstborn of God, which later on in tradition, of course, was called the Christos, um, the manifest word, the light of God, firstborn, and then got associated with certain personalities. Um, but that's our destiny, all of us, to reveal that, our own light that we've got, because we all carry that center of love, that center of light. We all carry that. So our destiny is eventually reveal more and more and more of it, because until we're all little microcosms of this macrocosmic truth. And the landscape helps us do this. In fact, the landscape itself can shine with light, and the whole world, the whole planet can shine with light um, in its own ways. Well, yes, and also the word mercury, you know, goes, goes back to the old word um, in Egypt, Markeru. So it's not just referring to what's symbolized by the planet Mercury, the, the trickster, the messenger of the gods. It's not just the messenger. It can be just, Mercury can refer to just the messenger, you know, who can go up and down the different levels and, and um, it's the serpent of the higher gods and so on. Um, but it can also refer to the divine Mercury, which literally means the Word of God, Word of God made manifest, the living Word of God, Mark Heru, Mercury. So there is, in this you get the idea that there is the Mercury, that's the trickster, plays tricks and so on, but there's a messenger and is evolving, going through initiation and eventually becomes the full manifestation of what his or her name means, because Mercury causes a hermaphrodite. It could be his or her. His or her name, when you completely fulfill that name, you become what that name really means, which means the word of God. And so in the mystery schools of old, when you reach a certain state of initiation, you were called Mark Heru. You were called the word, the living word of God. It was seen to shine from you. And that was a certain stage of initiation that you achieved after you'd been through the initiatory psychological death and resurrection. Um, and the story of Jesus, like the story of other saviors, is simply the story of the initiatory path to reach that stage. You go through that death, then that resurrection, and you are then hailed, recognized as that expression of the divine light on earth. You, you have fulfilled the name of Mercury or Markeru. Uh, in other words, you become an Apollo um, in terms of a person, personality on earth. Well, following those earlier, early days, and I started off on all this journey, um, I was finding things out in the landscape and, and studying a lot and getting guided by, by my inner teachers. And... Um, and I was sharing this information with my godmother, my aunt, who has become my godmother. And one day she said, oh, you should read this book. Because this book is saying similar things to what you've been telling me, you see. So um, she sent me the book. And it was called The Light in Britain by Grace Cook. And as I read it, I was astounded. Well, no, that's the wrong word. I was overjoyed because... You know, I, w I wasn't sure of myself in those days. It, it felt true to me, but I didn't really know. I was a very shy person, very secretive, being Scorpio by nature. Um, didn't tell anybody except Sarah when I met Sarah. I met Sarah by then. I just shared it with my godmother. And, and she sent me this book. And here, here's the book going through different special places in Britain. And as Grace Cook went there, she had her own insights, and then White Eagle would give a teaching. 
And I found, even to the smallest detail, what was written there in the book matched everything I'd, I'd already received myself. So I thought, whoa, <laughs> I must join the White Eagle Lodge and learn some more. And so I did. And um, so in other words, I found my spiritual home, if, if you like, for my training and everything like that. And I still regard, always will regard, White Eagle as one of my spiritual teachers, a very wise soul, um, who uses, incidentally, the symbol of the White Eagle, which is the symbol of St. John, St. John the Beloved, St. John the Divine, for a reason, a reason which I later came to, to know. Um, but he symbolizes himself through an incarnation he had as a North American um, Indian chief. And, um, but of course, he's had many other incarnations. But he chose certain things to present himself through as, as a message. And part of that message coming through was the importance of linking Europe with North America, which is part of this process of linking throat with brow chakra to throat hears the word, speaks it to the brow, the brow sees it as the vision and then can put it into action. It's part of the natural process of planetary evolution. And, um, and this I came to understand finally through my researches into Shakespeare, Bacon and the Rosicrucians of that Elizabethan and Jacobean era that had a very, very wonderful mystery school in operation then and were working with these geomantic knowledges. All very hush-hush, of course, um, nowadays, it's wonderful. We can talk more openly about it, although we can still be laughed at by most people. Um, but in those days, if you mentioned it at all, you were know, for the chop, or worse, you know. You had to be very, very, very careful um, what was said or, or written down. So that's why it's very, very difficult to research these things, but, but the information is there once you start to dig, dig deeply. Well, I would just want a little bit of what White Eagle taught, because I've, I don't know why I've, I just resonate with this as a truth. And I, I guess I've spent 30 odd years since then trying to, well, finding things out, and partly the reasons that to have some raison d'etre for believing this truth. Have some reason for it. There has to be a science behind it. It can't just be some throwaway remark, you know. It has to be a science. And I think I found the science behind it, and that's what I want to share. Um, anyway, this is from White Eagle's teaching about Hyperborea. Arthur, meaning that's an older name for Arthur. Arthur is a corruption of Arthur. Arthur and his knights are the godmen or masters from other planets who came on planetary rays as teachers for evolving humanity, as guardians of the young human race. They came to direct and assist in the building of the star temple of this world. They came first to Hyperborea, where the ancient wisdom was anchored 18 million years ago. <laughs> wow, okay. Okay, now I just want to give a little, little, bit, little bit of my own explanation of this. Um, Ar Artor is the ancient mythical Hyperborean king in, in the mysteries, representative of the sun king or solar logos. And Artor's teachers are, in modern language, Merlin and Morgana, the archpriests of a yet higher evolution and the personifications of the holy breath of wisdom. And Merlin and Morgana are associated with Sirius, the dog star, guardian of the round table of the zodiac. So Arthur and Guinevere, his, his queen, are represented by the sun itself um, in the sky, our sun. But a, a greater star system is um, Sirius, and Sirius is seen as the guardians of our solar system and our wisdom. So, in, in the mystery tradition, it said the, the greatest teachers of all that we have actually come from Sirius, but they come from Sirius via our sun and from the sun to our Earth, sometimes through other planets, particularly Venus. So there's a kind of connection, whether it's a real connection um, in, a, in a sort of like a physical route that the souls take, or whether this is just symbolism, you know, you take your pick, which it is. It might be both, both symbolic and, and real. But anyway, 
the teaching is done in that way, that from Sirius come the greatest teachers of all to this planet, who are guardians of the whole round table, which is defined by the sun's path through the sky for us. And then they come via the sun, as take, you know, take on the, 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 the um, costume of the sun, um, become sun beings, collect others around them who are already initiates of the, of the solar system, of, of the sun, and then they come via another planet like Venus, most of them come via Venus to this earth as the great teachers on this earth, picking up other souls on the way as they come, depending on the evolution of the different souls. And so they assemble on earth, and the first place they came to was this place on earth uh, called Hyperborea. Now, if you go back to the ancient Greek myth, the ancient Greek myth was referring to Hyperborea, first of all, as the place that where Nox, night, starts from in her movement. That is, it's the source, the source, the starting point, the heart of everything. And then she moves southwards and creates the north wind. And so the Hyperborea, which means the land beyond the north wind, is referring to the source of that north wind, where the north wind comes from where Nox started coming from. She's coming from that place that is the source. But that archetypal story has then been related to a particular place on Earth. It's grounded in some way. So this wisdom is acted out in a certain way on Earth, in a way that's according to the wisdom. It's, it's some sort of manifestation of this greater wisdom there. And it, it involves place, it involves human souls, and, um, and so on. Also, I should mention Arthur and Guinevere, besides, besides being associated with the sun itself uh, in the sky, are also associated with the sign of Taurus, the alpha sign, um, where Arthur is associated with Taurus and Guinevere with the Pleiades um, as, as their first key sign, secondary sign that they're so mainly associated with, of course, is Leo and Cancer the king and queen signs of the zodiac, as they're called. Now, White Eagle continues. And incidentally, this is not just White Eagle's teachings. I've, I've traced them also to other sources in other spiritual traditions as well that um, other people have researched and found these things. Um, so referring to humanity, at that time of Hyperborea, White Eagle says, for a time the young souls of humanity lived in celestial mental bodies upon Hyperborea, which was what we would, in another tradition, call paradise, but not physical paradise. It's, it's, it's in the higher regions of life. So they had living in celestial mental bodies upon Hyperborea whilst the solar power was being earth whilst the solar power was being earthed. Solar power carrying this great wisdom, the light. The light is the wisdom itself. And then as Mu, the motherland, developed sufficiently to support the life forms, so the young souls descended into denser astral bodies upon Mu, under the direction of the masters of Hyperborea, the Sun Brotherhood. Upon Mu, the ancient mother ritual was practiced to create physical bodies suitable for man's incarnation and expression. So the human race hasn't taken on physical bodies as yet. They're, they, they're slowly coming down the different levels of life, getting, creating denser and denser bodies or vehicles of incarnation until eventually it becomes physical. And then, and ten and a half million years ago, came the projection into the denser physical bodies in five different ways and in five different parts of the world in the landmass called Mu. Mu, the mother, motherland, refers to the whole landmass of the world, not just a particular area of the world. The whole landmass of the world was called the motherland, Mu. And part of that, uh, uh, some part of that, was Hyperborea. Somewhere within Mu, was Hyperborea, but Mu is the rest of the landmass. So you could, you, I mean, nowadays you could call it the five continents that we have. But something like that, and there were five projections, five places on Earth where the human souls took on physical bodies. Um, the main one, one that's been discovered so far, of course, through um, 
uh, archaeological research and so on, is um, on the Great uh, Rift Valley in Africa, which is on the Nilotic Meridian, the, the, the Great Meridian that goes through um, the, the Great Pyramid. And that, incidentally, is where nearly all the ancient gold mining used to be done along that meridian uh, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And it's thought by, by our modern science that that is the origins of physical humanity um, right there in Africa. But I, Sarah and I have come across another very, very important and powerful tradition that also is another type of humanity that emerged from the underground caves that are now underneath the Mato Grosso in Brazil, in Central America. Another form of humanity came out from there. And we've been there. We've, we've, we've met people who are guardians of these caves. We've been in the caves ourselves. And um, it, it's a powerful thing. It, it's, there is this story that um, the first mystery school set up to teach humanity was actually founded there in the, what's now the Mato Grosso of South America, central part of South America. It's the first mystery school there. And then when humanity started to become more corrupt, be given more responsibility, but at the same time become more corrupt, the initiates and masters who live more or less in their light bodies retreated a bit and went totally underground. And they still are there underground now. So there are these great tunnels natural tunnels under the Mato Grosso that go for miles and miles. And we stay with Shivanti Indians, guardians of one of the tunnel entrances. And they, they've got stories of how they themselves and their ancestors walk these tunnels and they now and again see these initiates in their light bodies in, in the tunnels here. And deeper in there is this underground city of, of initiates that once was above ground as well, teaching humanity, but now it's retreated. That's supposed to be the first great mystery school set on, up on Earth. The second one was set up over in, in the Himalayas. Himalayas. Um, but that was the second one set up on Earth. Anyway, these are stories I'm sharing with you. I, I think they're true. I believe they're true. They, they certainly match up with researches I've been doing and other people have been doing. But of course, we have to check them ourselves. You know, we've all got to carry out our own research. And, see if these things are true. But um, if they're really true, it's a fantastic story. It's a wonderful story, absolutely wonderful. And it leads up to what, what's happening now. So White Eagle goes on. When this projection occurred 10 and a half million years ago, he says, this happened when the young souls of humanity were sufficiently infused with certain solar elements by the White Brethren, also known as the plume serpents, and their spark of divine consciousness became quickened. At the same time, they began to realize their individuality and the fall into denser physical bodies took place under the guidance and testing of Lucifer. So here you have the original idea behind the story of the Garden of Eden and the fall of Adam and Eve from that garden. garden. I mean, it's a story that historically can be applied to later on in human evolution, but going back to its origins, it comes to when human souls can go first time into physical bodies and, and guided by this great teacher known, known as Lucifer. Lucifer means the light bearer. It's only in Christianity that Lucifer was turned into the devil, something not so nice. But Lucifer in tradition is known as the light bearer and the great hierophant and an and tester of the initiates. The hierophant, the one who teaches, also tests, just like teachers will do at school. You get taught and you get tested to see how good you are at it. So anyway, we, we can learn and, and know our own abilities. We have to be tested, otherwise we'll never know and we'll never get better and better at something. So that, that's what the Hierophant and the tester means. So Satan, the old name for the tester, is also the name of the Hierophant of the mysteries. Hierophant's the teacher and the tester. We all have to learn and pass our exams. And it's only through Christianity all this ancient wisdom teaching got distorted into this awful thing that it's become. Um, but I guess that's part of the dark age that we've been going through. And then White Eagle goes on to say, 
about Atlantis, Atlantis was one of the continents inhabited as part of Mu. So Mu, the motherland, the great landmass of the world, part of that landmass became known as Atlantis. And then he goes on about a great convulsion that happened. Then came an interstellar convulsion which shifted the Earth's axis and the ice ages began two million years ago, approximately. Well, different people have, have worked this out for themselves and um, the different ideas of what happened, whether it was something happened to our planet or something, or something happened to the solar system as a whole. Uh, White Eagle's actually implying it's something even bigger that occurred in, in the galaxy. Um, some convulsions which shifted our Earth's axis. Now he's not talking about the magnetic axis because that periodically shifts and it doesn't really do a huge amount of damage to us. It's quite a natural phenomenon. But if you shift the main axis, the physical axis of the world, that, that is very dramatic. That makes a very, very big difference. And, um, and that main axis of the planet is, is on, a, as far as I understand it and others understand it, is, it has a certain angle with its ideal axis it should have. It has a certain angle which is a harmonic uh, related to our own evolution and the sun itself. And sun, you know, it's something that enables us to live our lives and evolve as we're doing. If we didn't have that axis and the wobble it produces, um, we would not have our sort of life on this earth. It couldn't exist. It'd be impossible. Um, so th this is, it sounds like a disaster, but it was probably a divinely intended thing so that life, our sort of life could happen on this earth. So White Eagle goes on, the Sun Brotherhood retreated then to the mountains of the Far East where they continue the projection of the Sun Star and the creating of the Star Temple of the World. The Star Temple of the World. Ha. That's why I showed you that picture yesterday of, of the world like a star. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. And through geomantic work, the landscape, working with the energy of the land, we can call them ley lines, geometric lines, whatever. They, they actually exist etherically in what's the ether of the world. And if you imbue that with love and consciousness, the right sort of consciousness, and movement, because energy is movement, so you move in love, visit these places, pilgrimage there, you can turn that dark ether into light. And then you get a shining, etheric body of the planet. The planet will shine with light, real light, spiritual light. Let's look at Atlantis. Atlantis, of course, gets its name from Atlas, the king of Atlantis. Now, in our British tradition, Atlas was also known as Albion. So when this land is called the land of Albion, it's referring to it as the land of Atlas. Albion and Atlas are the same. And they're referred to as being a giant, the giant Albion, the giant Atlas. But not necessarily in physical stature. It's referring to the greatness of that soul, the greatness of that being. And if you take um, the different traditions one can look at in this, which explain what's meant by Atlas, and one of them is the Hebrew tradition, very old tradition, going back through ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, and beyond that to Atlantis, because they claim their whole wisdom was taught to them by Enoch, which is a title of Atlas. Enoch means the, the initiate. Capital T, capital I, the initiate. And they explain that Enoch was the first human soul on earth to go through all the initiations, and reach the highest level of consciousness uh, possible, the seventh heaven of the, that's said to be the dwelling place of the spirit of the Messiah. And by reaching that level of initiation, Enoch himself became imbued with that spirit of the Messiah so that he was himself, as a soul, individual soul, a Messiah or the Messiah. He was one with the uh, universal Messiah. So he became, if you like, the first human soul to reach that level and express it on earth. That's Atlas, king of Atlantis. Enoch and the Hebrew traditions say all the wisdom teachings 
come from Enoch, because he was the first one to understand and interpret them all, which means to manifest them in his life. So he fully understood it, not just intellectually, but practically. You know, like what modern science is trying to say, you know, which, which Francis Bacon urged on to scientists. You know, don't just think it, do it, and then see if you know it. You only know it if you do it. Um, then you'll really know. That's the real knowledge. Um, so Atlas was the one who could do it. You know, he had that great achievement. So he knew. And it said all the great wisdom teachings we have still handed down to us, um, some of them are hidden, we have to discover it, they, they stem from Enoch or Atlas. It's not to say we're not adding more to it all the time because the um, wisdom tradition is a living tradition. It keeps growing and growing and growing all the time. All of us are adding our bit to it in our lives. We're adding more to it. And whatever we add in that's true will go into the... Um, general consciousness of the whole planet, so other people can tap into whatever you discover. You know, that's fantastic. So when, and, and also it works the other way, when you get a great idea, you think, oh, I'm the first one to get that idea. Just pause a moment, <laughs> like Portia says uh, to Shylock, you know, pause a moment, haven't you forgotten something? Um, that idea may not have been original to you, you may have picked up the idea that someone else had and has put into the mass mind of humanity uh, through their own endeavors. So it's good to remain humble about these things. Be proud of your own achievements. You know, it's great to have got that idea for yourself, but don't think, oh, I'm, I'm the only one who ever had that idea. Because <laughs> that, that's the way that the real fall happens, I think. Um, so it's always good to acknowledge we're always inspired, we're always linked to others. Everybody in the world is contributing in some way. Um, now another name for the spirit of the Messiah in the Hebrew tradition is Metatron. It refers to the angelic form and presence of the Messiah. Metatron. Many people are banding that word around now. But that's what it means. It's the angelic name Messiah. And so when a human soul like Enoch is able to manifest that as a human soul, they become one with what Metatron means, or Messiah means, the anointed one, the one who sounds the true word. In Islam, they refer to the same being as Idris, I-D-R-I-S which can be interpreted as the green one or the evergreen, giving the idea of the soul who's become ever-living all the time, beyond death now, because you've reached that height of achievement, Idris. But Idris actually is the Arabic pronunciation of the god name, the Egyptian god name of Osiris. So Idris is Osiris. Osiris is the same as Enoch or Atlas. And in the Greek, in, in the Egyptian tradition, uh, Osiris is the son of Geb, the earth, and Nut, heaven. Heaven and earth, the two polarities of life, come together in love, uh, love loving union, and create um, Osiris. And then another name in the Egyptian tradition that um, this being was given was Temu, T-E-M-U, or Artem. I've referred to Artem. Artem is the unborn one, and then becomes Temu. And these, these two words mean all and nothing. They can mean those two things, the all or the nothing, the no thing. All things or no things. Has, has that double, double meaning. And the symbol of, of Temu was the sacred hill or island that rises above the waters. And that's where the idea of the pyramids came from. The pyramids are an architectural representation of the primeval mound or hill or island that rises above the waters. In, in the... Um, it's a symbol of the idea that the waters is, is the lower aspect of, 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 of matter, 
and the astral level. And if we progress enough, we will rise above that level of consciousness into the air of the divine light and be illumined directly by the divine light. It's also referred to in Christian Hebrew traditions as the two baptisms, the baptism by water when we're, when we're emerged in the, immersed in the water and then we raise out of the water into the second baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, which is the light, the sunlight. So that's the second baptism, which is built into the Christian tradition and initiations. In, in, I'll tell you a little bit about the Egyptian cosmology of this. Temu is seen as the creator god. It says, in the beginning he lay dormant as the seed of life within the nun, the universal void of darkness. Um, it's the Greek chaos, or, or nut. Uh, a nox. Um, and when, and it's also, that's also described as the great ocean. When awake and active, Temu became the spirit that moved upon the face of the waters, who came into being of himself. And the Greeks associated Temu, who's Enoch or Atlas, um, with Hermes Trismegistus, Hermes the thrice greatest as also did the Sabian cultists of medieval Arabia and the Mandaean Gnostics of Iraq. And as I mentioned before, the Romans called the same being Mercury. Now, it's, it's said in all these different traditions, the wisdom teachings come from Enoch, Atlas, Temu, Azaris, Idris, whatever you like to call him, there's this first great human soul, this, this great soul incarnated amongst us as a human, human soul and, uh, to show us the way. It's also said he comes again and again and again whenever we have need um, to teach us and take us through initiation until we all eventually as human souls reach that same level of evolution, that same level of expression of the divine love, the divine light. And, um, and it's usually that coming again is in certain time moments, moments in time, because time is part of the initiatory process. It's good to know how time works. Time and space are two, two sides of the same coin. And um, so as we learn about the landscape and places in the landscape, which do with space, we also need to learn about time. And that's why um, builders of the megalithic circles and so on connected their design to time, which they marked by where the stars and the planets were in the sky. It's critical to know time and place, or space. It's critical to know these two things. And at certain power points in this time cycle, and in certain places on Earth that you can get to know, this great expression of the divine light will appear. And you can get to know when it will happen. And one of those moments, one of those great moments is right now. And the place that's going to happen that's been identified is right here in this what, land of Britain. Yeah, that's one of the great secrets, great secrets of life. It's hard to share it widely. I'm sharing it now publicly for the first time. I only usually talk privately about this because still these days you can get, you know, <laughs> throat cut metaphorically in some sort of way. And... Um, so one has to be careful about these things, but we're so, so near, so near that critical moment. We've got to shout about it now. I feel if you've got to shout it from the rooftops. Now is the time. Don't miss it. So it's so easy to miss it and not be prepared. You know, think, think of the parable Jesus gave of the seven wise virgins and seven not-so-wise ones. Seven wise ones went into the paradise, but the seven ones who weren't prepared, um, they didn't. They missed it. Missed the opportunity. Well, we will never know. It's told we'll never know the exact moment when this happens. We'll never know the exact moment. We can get a kind of idea of it. We can narrow it down to a year or two, which is pretty good. But, you know, which month, which day, which, which hour of the day, which minute is it going to happen? We don't know. We never will know. It'll just come, boom, like that. And you either... Be ready for it, be ready for it. 
If you're not ready for it, you'll miss it. And I've no idea what will happen then, no idea at all. Uh, we just have to wait and see. Perhaps the world just muddles on in the way it's <laughs> been doing, but I don't believe that. I think we're in, in, the, in the middle of huge, huge changes. One, one of the fundamental aspects of this wisdom teaching is summed up in the, the pattern that's called the tree of life. Um, the Hebrews have preserved it, but it was known to the ancient Egyptians. I, you know, I can find it. I've talked about it for years and years. Uh, the ancient Egyptians knew the whole tree of life pattern. It's represented by the, the gods of Helios, gods and goddesses of Helios, that whole hierarchy of, of the tree of life. They also knew the chakra systems and worked the chakra systems, so their main teaching centers were expressing the chakras um, in Egypt and so on. But that, that culture itself says it derived its knowledge from Atlantis. They're only a colony of Atlantis. So where, where then is At Atlantis? Well, if you take the Greek myth of Atlas, uh, the, the later, later stories, in other words, it's still revealing. Atlas was the eldest son of the great god Poseidon and a mortal woman, Cleto, daughter of Evanor and Lucip. And he was the eldest of ten sons, comprised five pairs of twins, so the first pair was Atlas and his twin brother, known as Hesperus. But another name for Hesperus was Hercules. So Atlas and Hercules are brothers. Then the other twins were Ampheres and Evamon, Menusius and Orthon, Elasipis and Mesto and Azes and Diapropas. I'm sure I pronounced it wrong, <laughs> but you, you can look this up. It's, these are well-known stories. Then Atlas married Pleione, also known as Hesperus, who was the daughter of his brother, Hesperus, or Hercules. So he married his niece, in other words, in, in this story. And Atlas was known as the Phoenix King, and his queen, Pleione, was known as the Phoenix Queen. So in other words, the phoenix, as a symbol, was devised to to symbolize these two great beings, these two great souls. So Atlantis was the original Phoenicia, land of the phoenixes, Atlas and his queen Pleione. And they had 14 daughters and one son. And this is, this is where the mythology is expressing the wisdom. And behind the wisdom, central part of the wisdom is the tree of life. So actually the story is organized according to the tree of life pattern. Um, so they had 14 daughters and one son. The 14 daughters consisted of the seven Pleiades and the seven Hyades. The Pleiades are on the shoulders of Taurus the bull and the Pleiades are at the mouth of Taurus the bull. Um, and they have a relationship in that way. I talked about it yesterday, the importance of the outer major chakra is where the breath comes in, spiritual breath comes in as inspiration, and then we breathe out physically to express that wisdom that's come into us in an outer way, the two, two gates of breath. And so these two groups, seven daughters, are representing these two gates in that way. And the sun was called Hyas. The Pleiades are symbolized as phoenixes or doves. So the, do the dove image, from the dove image is built up the image of, of the phoenix. And the Hyades were symbolized as pigs or sows because they're feminine. Um, so it's, it's an interesting story about the sow. It comes into the wisdom tradition. I found it through my researches into Bacon, Francis Bacon and so on. But it's, it's said in tradition that the, the, the pigs um, with a boar or sow, go, go along the ground, you know, hunting for what's in the ground, for the roots and so on. Um, and as they do so, they imprint the ground with the AA sign, the double A. And they said their nostrils looked like two A's. Well, more, more like a, an M, really, like that. But it's symbolized as two A's together. And this AA sign is one of the major secret signs of the mystery schools, this double A. And it, as I said yesterday, it represents the Alpha, Omega and, and other things. And so this is said to be imprinted by the pigs on the earth itself as they burrow in, into the landscape. Um, and then the story of Europa and the bull. 
carries this whole story where Europa is, is the Pleiades uh, together. The Pleiades were wooed, or Maya, the eldest of the Pleiades, who also represents all of them, was wooed by Zeus and gave birth to the sun that's called Hermes or Mercury. As I said yesterday, Maya is the same as, as Europa or Persephone in the Greek myths or Mary in the Christian story. And Hermes is the same as Mercury um, or Dionysus or Christ. Same, same story, just different names according to the different language and culture. It's, the Pleiades were also known as the Atlantes or Hesperides. It says that when Atlantis sank, the Pleiades were lifted out of the watery depths on the shoulders of their father, Atlas, whence they became the seven sacred islands of Atlantis, known as the Atlantides or Hesperides. So in terms of planetary location, you get the idea that these islands, the British Isles, are these Pleiades. That's why they get associated with the story of the Hesperides. We are the Hesperides, the sacred isles of the west or the north you know, the, the, the Hyperborea. Uh, but in terms of the Atlantean story, we're the sacred islands of the West, the Hesperides. And then you can also follow on that story, you know, grounding in terms of landscape. You get the idea of Atlas lifting them up on his shoulders. So then if you look at the landscape of Europe, you get the idea that Atlas himself is associated with, with the bull, with Taurus, and therefore with the, the mainland of Europe. I'm going to show you a star map. So in this map of the northern sky, at the top of the map you'll see Taurus and Gemini, that special cusp where our midsummer sun is at the moment. And in Taurus you can see the Pleiades. So here's Taurus, there's the horns of Taurus pointing to the AA point, the cusp of Gemini Taurus. And that's where the finger of Orion also points, the finger of God from which it was created. So it's said. And there's then Taurus unfolds here. The head, you mostly see the head and shoulders of Taurus. The rest of the body is normally hidden in, in this symbolism. Um, so there's the great head, here are the shoulders, and on the shoulders are the Pleiades. And there are the Hyades, there, the sisters of the Pleiades. And that's a close-up of it, so you can see it a bit better. In later Greek myths, um, Atlas became known as Agenor, the king of Phoenicia, whilst his queen Pleione was called Telephassa. And three sons were ascribed to them, Minos, Sarpedon, and Radamanthus. And this was applied by the later Greeks, or at least scholars researching it now, who think they've interpreted the Greek myths. They're applying that to a certain island in the Mediterranean. But if you follow the story right back to its source, you'll find it's talking about something else on a much big, on a bigger scale. Um, one of the things that Atlas is famous for is holding the heavens and earth apart. For one reason or another, in the different stories about why, he was given the job of separating the heavens from the earth uh, to allow manifestation to take place. And um, so there's, a, there's a, st a picture of him holding up the heavens. He doesn't hold the physical earth. People who represent us as that have got the story wrong. He's holding the heavens up. That's the globe of the heavens. And he's standing on the earth. He's holding them apart. And as long as he holds them apart, manifestation takes place. If they came together, everything would disappear from manifestation. So Atlas is key to all things manifesting. He's representing the in-between state state of the human soul, if you like, and, and the soul of all, all life. And he, in the story, he gets, he gets a bit tired. And um, so Hercules, his brother, comes along and says, look, I'll, I'll, I'll hold it. I'll, I'll hold these apart for a bit. So while you take a rest, you know, go and have a cup of tea or something. <laughs>
Hercules takes over. So he, for a time, holds heaven and earth apart. Then Atlas comes back and they revert back to their original position. And there are symbols of this, are what are called the pillars of Atlas or pillars of Hercules, that make the two great pillars that stand before entrance to a temple. This is not just in terms of Solomon's temple, but in terms of the Egyptian temples, the Greek temples, and temples elsewhere, including in this country, like at the Rollwright Stones, there's a special entrance to the Rollwright Stones, two big stones each side at the portal. These are the two entrance stones, the gateway to the mysteries. And in our cells, they represent our two arms and legs, the right and the right hand and left hand side of the body, holding heaven and earth apart. But in between, we have our spine, our middle part. And actually, it's that middle pillar, as it's called in tradition, the axis or spine, that is the name of Atlas. Atlas means the pillar, the axis of the universe or the axis mundi, the axis of the world, the central pillar. And symbolized in tradition by the central pillar standing up, which is usually done not as two big pillars like this, but of what's called the, the altar stone, the smaller stone standing in the heart of the temple. In Solomon's temple, it made the altar of incense at, at the heart center of the temple. That was, that's the middle pillar. So it's something that's humble and it's associated with sacrifice. In, it, in terms of Atlas, his sacrifice is holding heaven and earth apart. But for us, it's a sacrifice. We give up something. It's a sacrifice symbolized by offering incense, representing the best of yourself on the altar, um, uh, to, to God, to the great principle of goodness. Sacrifice yourself on this heart altar, symbolized by the smallest stone. That later became carved as the double cube stone. It became known as a double, double cube stone. Before that, it was just like a, a, a standing stone, but sometimes carved as what's called the um, omphalos, the center, like at Delphi, the omphalos at Delphi, the omphalos in London. London stone was the original omphalos of London. In the heart center of London city, St. Paul's is on the crown chakra, so it would have a different stone, stone for, a, for, cr for representing the crown chakra, but in the heart, which is by the heart river, the small river, the Warbrook, was the, the original um, omphalos of London. Only a fragment remains, we saw, saw a picture of it, uh, because it got blown up um, in, in the war by a bomb. So, and so this one fragment was, was um, rescued and, and preserved as it is now. But it's described as if it was quite big. So some, some of the stories make it as big as, as a man, you know, six foot man. Um, and these foundation stones were also associated with royalty because it's the center, the heart of everything. And when the right person is there by the stone, it's said that these stones roar like a lion. You know, it's a sun symbol. They, they, sun stones, but they're the spiritual sun, the spiritual center. They roar. There's still one standing at Ushna, which said to roar when the Irish prince will go there, who's going to be the high king. When the right prince is there, stands on the stone or by the stone, and it will set said to roar, and then people will recognize him as the high king of Ireland. Now, to give you some of the inner meaning of all this, in ourselves, our spine is our pillar, central pillar, represents our central pillar. And the highest bone, the 33rd bone in the spine, is called the atlas. So Plato's story of Atlantis, you can actually find he's embodying the wisdom in this. And part of the wisdom is that Atlas's palace is on the highest um, pinnacle of Mount Atlas in the center um, of Atlantis. And um, so here it is at the, the top, top of our bone, in the, uh, of our, of our top of our spine, our spine going down the center of our body in, in that sense, the atlas bone. And interpreted in our body, we have atlas itself 
who, who lives at the height, height of the, the pillar, he lives in the highest part of the pillar, um, he is holding heaven and earth apart. Well, heaven is associated with our head in these stories. And the earth is associated with our body. And that which holds the two apart, head from the body, is the neck. And so you can get an idea from this that the place that's called Atlantis is actually associated with the neck and therefore with the throat. There of the throat chakra and the outer major chakra and the th whole throat itself with its seven bones um, that are in it. Therefore, when we come to look at Plato's story, where he's giving hints of this, it's no wonder that he relates Atlantis to just the center of Atlantis, the city of Atlantis, says it's just beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which has been related to the uh, Straits of Gibraltar in terms of the physical presence in the landscape. Incidentally, it wasn't the only part of the landscape that's referred to as the Pillars of Hercules, but at the time, that's what Plato was meaning, and that's what was passed on in its interpretation. And then people have speculated, well, the island, island of Atlantis was either just there, that, that's the most common interpretation, just west of the um, Straits of Gibraltar, or right out in the mid-Atlantic Ocean. But in fact, Plato refers to Atlantis being made up of three large continents and a group of seven smaller islands, but islands that were large in themselves. So it wasn't just one island, it was, seven, it was three big continents, or three land masses, and seven smaller ones. But of course, one reason he's done that is he's relating it to the tree of life, the holy three and the seven that come from the holy three, giving you the ten in total. That's one of the reasons. But he goes on, he also says the Atlanteans had a war with the Greeks, but the before that, the Atlanteans had been colonizing each side of the Mediterranean. Um, I showed this yesterday. This, this is um, the vision I had of the world dragon, which made sense of the chakras. So here you have that Europe and the Mediterranean, in the middle of this area, is the throat area of the planetary chakra system. And this is what is being related by Plato to Atlantis itself, Atlantis and its colonies. And so you get an idea, if you follow the spine of the, the dragon, think of that as our own spine, you come up to the neck here from the, from the Middle East onwards through Europe, you're going through the neck bones, which can be seen as the seven chakras of Europe, and then you get to the, the last bone, the seventh bone, you get the atlas bone, which would fit just there at the pillars of Hercules, uh, you know, straight to Gibraltar, somewhere there. So that highest point, central point, could be an imaginary island by Plato, just to make sense of this whole story. But it does get related also to, um, to the sacred isles in, in another way. The sacred isles of Pleiades that are the daughters of Atlas, and um, which are these, the British Isles up, up here. So there's what we've researched so far, the chakras through Europe, but we also need, I haven't done this yet, there's also, one can envisage, there's a similar chakra system through Northern Africa, balancing the European one with the Mediterranean in between. And there's an, a central axis through the Mediterranean, which would have been the central axis of ancient Atlantis, with the, the top point, the crown point, somewhere up here. And in fact, the Atlas Mountains are right there in that northern part of, of Africa there. They're still called the Atlas Mountains. You know, that gives you another clue, another clue to all this, all this story. And so you, get, you get, get in this, the idea that you've got Europe and Northern Africa in this throat area of, of the world. Um, North America, over the, over the Atlantic Ocean, is, is the head, 
with the brow chakra in it. The rest of the world, as Plato calls it, the rest of the world is the body containing the other, other chakras in it. Um, and Plato refers to Atlantis that from the center of Atlantis, the central place of Atlantis, across the great ocean, is a huge continent that was also colonized by the Atlanteans, he says in his story. Well, there across the ocean, the ocean is the Atlantic Ocean, and the other side of it you get the head, you get North, North America there, across that ocean. So the clues are there, the clues are in the myths, Plato's and other Greek myths and older myths, which are conveying the wisdom, conveying something that relates to us as human beings, in how, how we are ourselves, and also relating something to the planet and, and even the landscape of the planet, physical places in the landscape itself. So we get to understand how everything works, how from the divine wisdom, the divine being, living being, is manifested as a human soul in a human body, but also as the world, as a living, living being, the world itself being a living being with its own chakra system and so on. Get all this wisdom embodied in, in these stories. And so let's go back there. The, the child of Europa and the bull, represented by the grail land. The grail land that's, you know, I showed you the importance of this yesterday, how, how this is the central part of the, um, the planetary dodecahedron. It, this is to do with Atlantis, but it's also to do with Hyperborea, which are described as these islands here, daughters, daughters of Atlas. that he bears on his shoulders. So there you say the bull there is, is um, a landscape form or symbolic form of Atlas in this, this particular instance. Atlas in the Greek myth having come Zeus. And then you've got, got the mother here who gives birth to the child. And that forms the higher triangle of this whole pentagram um, image there. Yes, exactly that, great worms. That's the focus of the throat chakra and, and the valley that goes up um, by, by it. Very, yeah, you, you'd love it, <laughs> special for you. <laughs> yes, it's very neglected. We, we've been there recently. The, 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 the people who live there, who make a living there, are in dire poverty at the moment because nobody is going there because of the economic situation. They, they, they're all closing up. All the hotels, inns, pubs, farms closing down. They're all closing down. They can't exist because nobody's going there anymore. And yet this is the throat chakra of the Grail Kingdom. We need to go. We need to sing. We need to listen. You know, the throat's about listening and singing. You know, uh, poor people. I feel so sorry for them. So neglected part of our country. It's in the York... Right, right up in Yorkshire, in the... In the in, yeah, it's Great Wensonite, yeah. And it's, it's this, this land, which is the Hyperborea part of Atlantis, which itself is part of Mu, the motherland, which is the whole planet, Hyperborea. And Hyperborea, the gateway or source for our body of the holy breath coming in. So the north, the, the north wind is the holy breath breath that creates, carries the wisdom and creates all things. It comes into the body through the outer major chakra. So the outer major chakra is that for our self as a person, that is the source coming of that holy breath coming into the body, into the heart of the body and then speaking itself um, through the throat chakra, either outwardly or to the mind um, in the head where the mind can see it as a vision and develop the idea and the thought of what to do. It's the vision, but the gateway in is there, the Hyperborea. No wonder the wisdom had to be anchored first in Hyperborea. You know, that's the science behind it. Came to the outer major chakra of the planet. Couldn't go anywhere else, could it? That's the first gateway for the wisdom to be carried into the body on, on the holy breath, the spiritual breath coming in. And that, that is the great secret of this land. Fantastic secret, so important. How do we open the 
way again? How do we... Well, actually, the wisdom's here already. How do we find that wisdom and bring it out? Well, we've been talking about that all weekend. You know, we can find it, and the land will teach us because the wisdom's in it. And then we can link in with even greater things beyond, beyond that, beyond this land. And the land itself, I found out, is, is, consists of these three beautiful circles. This is the geometry, spiritual geometry or etheric geometry underlying this landscape, recognized by our old cultures. So um, England had its center at High Cross, where the Watling Street and, and Fossway Cross, the Celtic rows before they were Roman ones, always known as the center of Britain. Um, called High Cross because it's a crossing point of the roads, the heart center of Roman Britain, and the heart center of Ireland, Ushna, already been mentioned. This year, for the first time, they've relit the fires at Ushna on May Day, on Beltane. Isn't that great? We've been working for this for years with, with our Irish friends, and now at last the farmers in that area have got together and they've launched it in a very big way. They had a practice what run last year, but this year was the real start. And it started just like Glastonbury started with its big festival. And they, they had a big, big, they had rock bands there and things like that, but, but with great reverence, huge reverence about it. It's not about making money, or well, of course they need to make money to run it, but they're doing it as an act of love, act of belief in, in Ireland. And you know, as soon as the heart opens again, it unites everything, brings everything together as one, and, and gives out that energy of love. It shines. And that the, the fires were lit at Beltane, and there were, is it 27? Where's Sarah? She knows the number. I not hear. I think there were 27 other fires lit around in the circle. And um, the original, the Celts originally would light a whole ring of fires on the mountains all around. Ushna, they were miles and miles away. And when those were lit, a second ring further out was lit again on, on the mountain tops all around. And this was the sign of, of the High King. The High King would have to extinguish his light. Every, every household in the country would extinguish their light on the eve of May Day. You weren't allowed to have a fire. Then the High King would assemble at, at Ushna. I think it was done every four years. He'd assemble there with the lesser kings and others around their big ceremony at Ushna, where the fire at Ushna never went out. It's kept alive by the Druidesses, um, personified by Bridget. They were all Bridgets, kept, kept the sacred fire burning. And on May Day itself, the king, a uh, second fire was lit, and the king was allowed to light his light um, from that fire, and he would take it back to. Um, his royal centre, and the other kings, the lesser kings, would take their fires out. And fires around, I um, mean, these two circles around the landscape, are called the Eye of Ireland. You know, if you look down on it, it's like an eye shining with light. It's called the Eye of Ireland. And then other people would light their fires from their, from, from their beacons and so on. So the land was relit again on, on Beltane. Beltane comes from the god name, Celtic god name Baal, Bel or Baal, B-A-L. Um, it, it's also used in the Hebrew language, the Aleph, Beth, Lamed. It refer, those are the three mother letters of the Hebrew alphabet. But an earlier alphabet than that is actually Celtic. Celtic is very, very, very ancient, and it carries this wisdom which the Hebrews later expressed um, themselves. A-B-L, the three, three mother letters of the language. It represents the whole alphabet, it represents the word of God. Baal is the word of God. And Hugh, or Lu, is the light of that word. So you first celebrate in the year Beltane, May Day, which is the word of God starting to sound. And we still have the word bell, you know, the bell of your heart, sounding, sounding the heart sound, the bell. The church bells and so on. It all represents this sound, sacred sound. And then it becomes light, which you then celebrate at Lunasar um, some months later. First bell, then Lou, in, in that way. It's a, wonder, it's a wonderful tradition. It's wonderful to do it again, you know, in that right sequence and knowing the reason for doing it. Doing the right sequence, right timing, right place, and so on, and magic, magic will happen. It, the the centre in Scotland, we found, is Dunsinan. And, of course, Shakespeare's Macbeth helped me with that because it refers to a very, very ancient folk story. 
Um, Macbeth's castle is the original royal centre of Scotland. Now this is the geomantic centre, not the geographic centre, but the geomantic centre. And that's actually where the real stone of Scone was hidden, so that Edward, the, you know, that nasty English king, Edward I, was it, went up to Scotland. He, he thought he got the, you know, he thought he'd captured the stone of Scone. He was given the wrong one. <laughs> So all our English sovereigns being carved on a substitute, being crowned on a substitute stone. Um, the real stone of Schoon was hidden in an underground cavern on the hill of Ushna all this time. And it was found, found within the last century, I mean within the last hundred years, by um, a shepherd boy who accidentally fell through the roof of this underground cavern. And there was the stone and other treasures there still preserved. Now the real stone has been hidden away again by the guardians, Scottish guardians of that stone. So now and again, one's privilege, you know, I'm privileged, Anthony's been privileged, others have been privileged, now and again to come into contact with people who possess that knowledge, who feel it's right to share it. And, and it's just like a, a glimpse, a glimpse. Doesn't mean to say they have, they're guardians of all knowledge, but they're guardians of that particular knowledge and they'll just let it be known now and again when the right person comes along. And um, so I feel very fortunate to know that. Then help me get this absolutely right. And then you get this wonderful equilateral triangle across the landscape, which these ancient, the ancient Celts, the, the, the Brythons, they were the oldest Celtic race here, they had this knowledge. And presumably, presumably their predecessors do, going right back to Hyperborea. You know, this, this is the wisdom anchored in this land. That, that is what we're talking about. There's the main chakra system we've discovered. And from high cross, each of these centers is the center of a landscape zodiac. So Anthony referred to the one that I've researched, uh, which I find that our previous generations, their mystery schools were using, including the Tudors, and often the kings and sovereigns themselves knew this knowledge and worked with it. Um, it was politically important as well as being important on the wisdom side. And um, so this, this is how it's worked out. And, um, you know, in Cygnus, in Cygnus, you've got the sweet swan of Avon, Shakespeare, in the Cygnus area. And that's why that story is associated with Shakespeare, who's associated with the Cygnus where strapped upon Avon is, is, is in that area for purpose. And London is on this cusp of, of um, Sagittarius Scorpio, which is where the midwinter mid sun is at the moment. So when the midsummer sun is on the other point, Gemini Taurus, the midwinter sun will be here, the AA points. And the magic thing is that once these points are recognized, the AA line starts to sing. Now the AA line is also known as the string of the celestial bow. The celestial bow itself being the Milky Way and the string being this axis between the two points where the ecliptic crosses the equator of the galaxy, the galactic equator. So it gives you the idea of the bow of the heavens. And when it's strung, as it said, then it sounds like a lyre, a single string lyre, but also shoots its arrows of love, its arrows of light at the same time. And I found this happening in smaller local landscape temples when it's been, they've been pilgrimaged sufficiently, enough attention is given to them. That, that axis starts to sing and, and the whole transforms the whole area. People change in the area without knowing why they've changed. Everything becomes sweeter, more beautiful, more prosperous as well. It's extraordinary. And I, I think our axis in Britain is is about to sing. Maybe it's even started already. I haven't heard it yet, but I think it's about to. The extraordinary thing is we went to look for the AA points up here, and what we found? Um, oh, first of all, we've, we reckon the, the Celts. So going back to this one, my, I, I, I think the, what was called the White Mound, where Bran's head was buried in the Celtic myth, Later on, William the Conqueror came and built the Tower of London, the White Tower, on top of this hill in order to take it over, control it. Because that's our real seat of sovereignty. You, you gain, in this country, you gain sovereignty from possessing the Tower of London. Before you're crowned, you have to sleep the night 
by tradition in the Tower of London and be given the keys to the Tower. If you don't possess the Tower of London, you cannot possess the kingdom. It's a very, very ancient ritual going back to um, Celtic times. But before the Tower, there was this white mount, the Bryn Gwynt, beneath which is buried Bran's head. Bran was a god associated with Anglesey, and his head was brought down this route, the original Grail route, and his head buried beneath the what's now the White White Tower of Tower of London. And I, I think, well, several of us think that this was the original marker the Celts did for this, this cusp of Sagittarius and Scorpio, this Gemini point, because that mound and also the White Tower itself represent the meaning of Atlas. They, they are the pillars or the, or the hill that's rising out of the waters. You know, the Temu idea. They're, they're representing that point. But this is the older culture. We went to the other end to see what, what, if we could find it. And lo and behold, where's the Tower of London? Yeah, the dream. We arrived just four months after it had just been finished and before it was officially opened. We were looking for it in the landscape. We were looking for the place in the landscape, which is, was full of old mining areas. And then suddenly we see this standing up like a white lingam. Now, in, in, in um, Hindu tradition, um, the stone called the lingam is called Shiva's lingam because Shiva is the same as Atlas or Enoch, same same idea, and represented by this stone and special stones. And during the Dark Age, it's always a black stone that represents Shiva. But when a Golden Age comes, the white stone represents Shiva, the white stone. And in India, they're waiting for this moment when they start using the white lingams. And look what's happened. I mean, <laughs> Here, here in Britain, we've got our white lingam, our white stone already erected. It's called the dream. It's the dream of the future. The miners, it's embodying the idea of the miners dreaming of a better future, a beautiful future, and transforming the old coal mines and poisoned land into a beautiful land. So around, this is on top of a whole coal tip, and they're going to change it into a landscape park for everybody to enjoy. And it's also to commemorate all the miners who've given their lives and died mining this coal deep underground, you know, this sacrifice of them. And, um, and it's the dream, it's this, young, this young girl dreaming of this golden future. Fantastic to come there. I mean, they didn't know that this was the AA point. <laughs> they didn't know, but they got it absolutely right. The land, the land has, the Hyperborean land has inspired them. Wonderful. And then I think, although I think the Tower of London and the, the mound it's on is the old Celtic representation of the cusp, I think our modern representation, um, whether you like it or not, is the Millennium Dome. I think that that is the modern, modern representation of, of this, uh, which is a nice feminine balance, actually, to the dream when you think about the shape, shape of the two. And then not far away from that cusp is the center of the galaxy. So there's, there's the cusp, and the center of the galaxy is very close to that. And that will marry, in, in that this landscape zodiac work I've done, that will marry pretty closely with Greenwich and the Greenwich Meridian and where the Olympic Games is going to be. Fantastic, isn't it? And it's the midwinter sun that, when you look at it in the sky, that looks in alignment with the heart of the galaxy. So when you look at the midwinter sun, you're actually looking at the heart of the galaxy, and you will see that energy from the heart, the greater heart of our Milky Way galaxy, direct to you, to us on Earth, via our sun, enhanced by our sun. So you get this whole line of traditional teaching of, of how the great beings, the great light, comes from the heart of the galaxy through our sun and, and directs this earth. 
happens once every 26,000 years. But something, there's an even greater cycle also manifesting. And, and here in the, just quickly, here's the landscape zodiac of the Thames, our holy river, River Thames, a compound word from Tem, Tame and Isis, two main tributaries. The Isis and the Tame come together at Dorchester to make the Tame Isis that's compounded, reduced to Thames. It's a hermaphrodite name. But the ch hermaphrodite child of Isis and Tame, that's like an Osiris, um, gives birth to our holy river, and along it is the chakra system. The Kingston Zodiac marks the heart chakra of this. That's where the Grail line of the Grail Kingdom comes through, the axis of the Grail Kingdom comes through there. And from that heart on the Midsummer line, um, it's already been explained to you, on the Midsummer Sunrise line, you, you come up to Westminster and to St. Paul's, which are in the throat and the brow chakra of this landscape accordingly. And the crown chakra is where Greenwich and the site of the of the Olympic Games is going to take place. All these different things coming together as one thing so that we can celebrate through games, joy, the Olympics, the, the Apollonian Games, to create light in this critical part of the whole planet so it turned into light. <laughs>